Here's an introduction to telescope optics to accompany chapter six of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So first, let me just start by saying that there are a lot of telescope types out there. So I'm gonna speak in pretty general terms here. Um, you know, you're probably used to seeing the type of telescope that has some big tube, maybe there's some lenses in there, there's an aperture, an astronomer looks through it at, uh, you know, with their eye and the eye is the detector. And that's, you know, maybe what you've had something like that at home or you've seen this cartoon before, but um, there's, there's lots of different types of telescopes. So this is going to be a more general uh, lecture. And then I have two separate ones on ground-based telescopes and space-based telescopes that are going to go into more of the details. So telescopes can, can come in many different uh, shapes and sizes. So you may see that kind of classical one with some lenses that focus some light towards your eye. Uh, but, you know, we have certain telescopes like X-ray telescopes where you can't really use lenses. Instead, you deflect uh, the X-rays with uh, sort of mirrors to a detector. Um, or you have uh, very different types of telescopes, like, for instance, a radio telescope. It looks like a giant satellite dish, and you can even combine these into uh, very large arrays to do some observations. So the, you know, regardless, the basic concept for any telescope is kind of the same. Uh, you basically need some kind of light collector. So your object down in space will shine light, you know, typically in all directions or many directions. Some of that light happens to be pointed towards your telescope. That telescope needs some light collector that's usually relatively large to collect a lot of light. Uh, that'll somehow redirect the light towards a detector, which is typically smaller, often for economic reasons. Um, and sometimes there'll be some kind of filter or separator here. So, so for instance, you may put a, uh, a filter that only allows certain wavelengths of light through, like just, just red light that you want to let through. Or perhaps this object could be some kind of separator, like a prism, that will bend different wavelengths of light a different amount and so that you can figure out how much you have of each given wavelength of light. And that, that might be something you want, for instance, if you want to record a spectrum. So there's, there's lots of different details, of course, that go into the telescope, but basically these are the, the main components. So the key for light collection is the aperture. So the, the bigger the light collector we have, the more light we're going to collect. So the size of an aperture is a very important metric for our telescope. Uh, typically speaking, your aperture is gonna be something circular. And so the, the light collecting area of your aperture is, its, is the area of a circle, which you uh, remember from geometry at one point that the area of a circle is pi r squared. So you know this is your constant pi, 3.14159 and so on. Um, R is the radius of the circle, and so that is going to be squared. Um, equivalently, you'll see the equation in the book, for instance, they have instead of radius, they have diameter over 2 squared, you know, same thing. Um, so the, the light collecting area, it scales as the square of the radius. So if you double the radius, you get four times the collecting area. And so that's important to, to note when you're looking at the aperture size is the radius or the diameter will be quoted, but you know, really you have to square that to compare the, the light collecting area. And you, you may remember this, uh, and if you don't know, this is a very important piece of information, you may know this uh, for pizza sizes. So you know, always get the big pizza, <laughs> never get the small one, because uh, a, a big pizza uh, will give you, in, in terms of the, the diameter, it gives you a lot more area than a smaller one. So this is just an example here. If you have an 18-inch uh, you know, diameter pizza, then that's equivalent to five 8-inch pizzas, right? You get quite a bit more. So even though it looks like it's a little over double uh, the radius, it's, it's a lot more than that. Uh, you know, it's five times in terms of the area. And the same thing applies here then for our telescope apertures. So the uh, classic optical telescope is something known as the refractor. So you know a good telescope is going to take a whole lot of light from a large aperture, and it's going to concentrate it down to a small detector. So you might have something like a huge uh, 
lens here, and then that can then focus your light down to something uh, smaller. So what the refractor does is it bends the light. This is a process known as refraction. Um, bends that light uh, to some, some other direction, and the, the bending is basically due to the curvature of the, the lens here. So because of the way the lens is curved, that's going to determine how the light is bent. And so your light will come in, uh, hit this big lens here near the big aperture, and then bend it down to something uh, smaller. And usually you'll have another tiny lens here, something called the eyepiece, and this is to uh, bend the light in a convenient way for your eye to see it. If you wanted to determine, um, you know, this, this key distance here, this focal length for a given lens, uh, we're not going to do that in this class, but it's something called the lens maker's equation. And if you take uh, physics uh, 2002 or 2052, then you, know, you would learn that equation and you could learn how to design the optics for a simple telescope. Now there's an issue with the refractor telescope and because of that issue, typically these are not used for research anymore. You, know, you can buy them for hobby telescopes, they do a good job. Uh, astronomy was founded on the use of refractor telescopes, but there's a big issue. Uh, known as aberration. So refraction, this is just you know the bending of light in a transparent medium. So like if you wear glasses, um, you know your glasses bend light. Uh, and light you know bends a different amount based on the wavelength. So you're probably familiar with prisms. You shine white light into a, a prism, and the blue light is going to be bent more than the red light, and you get this uh, you know Pink Floyd cover looking kind of thing. But you can see, so the, the light isn't going to be focused by a lens at this same position, depending on, a different, on the color. And so typically, you know, um, any object, for instance, we've learned about black bodies, you have a, a range of wavelengths for any given object, and some of those wavelengths are going to be bent more than others. And so this is going to cause an issue called chromatic aberration. So it's going to blur your image and create a rainbow effect. So the, the blurring is because a really tightly you know, focused beam of light here literally gets physically spread out onto your detector, whether that be um, your eye or a CCD of a camera. So that's going to cause some blurring. And then the rainbow effect is, is somewhat obvious from this picture, right? You're specifically spreading out the wavelengths. And so if you look here near some of the sharp features, you see kind of a rainbow sort of effect. And what we're comparing here is a very nice lens where they've tried to correct for the chromatic aberration and a cheaper one where no such effort was made. So chromatic aberration is a big problem for refractors, so they're not really used for astronomy research anymore. So the, the upgrade to this is instead to use the reflector. So the, the idea is the same. We want to take a big aperture and we want to focus that light down to a smaller, more convenient size, like, it, like for instance, the size of our, of our eye so we can detect it with the small detector. So instead of bending the light with a, a, a lens and refraction, you're going to bend the light with reflection and a mirror. So you basically just have a mirror of some shape so that when light comes in and it reflects off, it's going to be focused to some given point here. And you need to put some other kind of redirection because you can't put your eye in the middle of a telescope that would block all the incoming light. So there's usually some other you know, mirror to redirect the light and um, redirect it in different ways depending on what's convenient for the uh, observational astronomer. And research grade telescopes are of this, this kind, they're reflectors. The final key quantity that we care about uh, for our telescope optics for this, this brief introduction here is the angular resolution. So this indicates the size of an object that a teles telescope can see. And you might think like, why can't you just state the size like, like a physical dimension, like a length? So can you make out something that's you know one meter, two meters, the size of a mouse versus the size of a house? The, the issue is that it, it depends on the distance from us, right? So if an object is very tiny, but very close to your eye, you can still see it. Um, but if the object's far away, you wouldn't be able to see it if it's really small. Whereas a bigger object farther away, you, you can see, right? And so really it's more of the angle uh, 
that this object subtends in space that is, is relevant. That tells you whether or not you can see an object. And when we speak in terms of resolution, we mean can we resolve the features on a given scale? So uh, for instance, can I make out the eyes of the smiley face or not? If I can, then for my angular resolution, I would figure out what angle this circle here, this eyeball, subtends in space. So I'd use trigonometry to calculate what that angle is because I have a height of an object and I have a distance to it. Um, so this angular size, this is the relevant quantity that we care about. A rough estimate of the angular resolution is this, this uh, equation here. So the angular resolution, this is an angle where you can use the variable r in this case. That's equal to the wavelength of light that you're observing in divided by the diameter of the aperture. So this is just lambda over d, and I have the subscript aperture here to make it clear what d is that I'm talking about. And this is in units of radians, because we're taking a length over a length. So radian is one way to measure an angle. If you're more familiar with degrees, which you probably are, then all you do is you take this result and multiply it by 180 divided by pi, and that gives you the angle in degrees. And note that we're typically going to be dealing with very small numbers here, because d, uh, the um, well, 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 as you can see, that the wavelengths typically are quite small, right? Especially relative to the diameter of the aperture. And that's it's important. These need to be small because we're looking at objects that are super far away, right? One thing you can see immediately from this equation is that if you have a longer wavelength, you're going to need a larger telescope, right? So if my wavelength is in the uh, radio, so it's like, let's say, meters long, well, if I want to be able to resolve anything, I need a huge aperture, right? I need a, you know, a hundred meter aperture to see anything of, of, of any size, really, uh, that's far away. If instead I'm dealing with something that's in the optical, then I can get away with a much smaller diameter aperture and have the same uh, resolving power, the same angular resolution. So let's just take an example calculation here. Uh, let's look at the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is a, a famous uh, telescope that observes in the optical, and the end slide of all these lectures is, is the ultra deep field from Hubble. So it's an optical image pointing at a what looks like a very dark region in space, and, and you look for long enough, you see all these galaxies. But in any case, uh, the diameter of uh, the Hubble aperture, the coll light collecting area, is about 2.5 meters. It's really more like 2.4, but this makes the math easier. Uh, we're observing in the optical, so the uh, wavelength is you know, something around yellowish, right? So 500 nanometers, we'll call it good enough for a representative case. So our resolving power then is this 500 nanometers that we can convert to meters divided by the collecting area, which is in meters here, so the units meters cancel, and you get 2 times 10 to the minus 7 radians. And if you want to convert that to degrees, you know you can multiply it by 180 over pi. Okay, so let's give that some context. Uh, a golf ball. The, uh, you know, there's usually text on the golf ball printing the brand, um, for instance, like Titleist. And the text size is, you know, on the order of 5 millimeters tall. Um, the orbit of Hubble is around 7 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So the Hubble Space Telescope is about that far away from our golf ball. So we can use trigonometry to figure out the angular size of that text uh, in terms of the distance from Hubble. And we can use the small angle approximation. So we just take the ratio of the, of the um, size divided by the distance. And we get something that's close to uh, 10 to the minus 6 radians. And so you can see that the Hubble Space Telescope can actually read a golf ball from that distance, which is remarkable. Um, one caveat here, though, is that the, the on-paper resolution uh, isn't accurate, um, you know, because of atmospheric effects. Um, a, a final note is that you'll notice, then, that this technology is not only useful for seeing things uh, far away in space, but also the same technology is used for reconnaissance <laughs> on the Earth, and the National Reconnaissance Office, you know, builds uh, telescopes 
like this, for instance, but, but to look at the Earth. Um, but that is all for this particular lecture, and that is it for this uh, introduction to telescope optics for Astronomy 1000.